pain relief you prescribe enhancing neural pathways to revive Ooh, block that net increase rapinephrine dig in duloxetine hey how's it going in this video we're going to talk about duloxetine or cymbalta so let me start with a brief summary to give us a little context before we move into all the specifics so the bottom line for duloxetine is it's typically viewed as one of the two main SNRIs that we use, the other being venlafaxine slash desvenlafaxine. And it has a niche for depressed patients with various comorbid pain disorders. However, its benefits need to be balanced with the fact that it has more side effects than the SSRIs. All right, now let's jump into the more boring general features of duloxetine. So the brand name of duloxetine is Cymbalta, and duloxetine slash Cymbalta as a modified release mechanism. So the delayed release capsule allows for a 12 hour half-life, whereas if it didn't have this mechanism, it would need to be dosed twice a day. The other form that duloxetine comes in is sprinkles, and the brand name for this is Drizalma sprinkles. So sprinkles are just what they sound like. Rather than take a capsule or tablet, you take little tiny sprinkles. So it's considered an option for patients who have trouble swallowing regular duloxetine, but it's currently brand name only, so it can be pretty expensive. In the biz, we call this a patent extender. All right, back to just regular duloxetine. So the dosages that the medication comes in are 20 milligrams, 30, 40, and 60 milligrams. The medication is FDA approved for MDD, GAD, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, fibromyalgia, and chronic musculoskeletal pain. Now, just a few little pearls about dosing. So compared to venlafaxine, we know that duloxetine has a more balanced affinity for CERT and NET. So we see both serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake blockade at about 40 to 60 milligrams per day. Now, as for the different indications, in neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia, doses above 60 milligrams per day have been associated with an increase in side effects without an increase in efficacy. We also see that in depression, doses greater than 60 milligrams have not been shown to be more effective, whereas it's customary to go a little bit higher in generalized anxiety disorder. Now, I say this, but keep in mind that there's huge variation in person to person. So these are just general rules of thumb that apply on the population level. So it doesn't mean that increasing the dose above 60 milligrams in a particular patient won't be helpful for that patient. So it's important to recognize that population-based statistics don't always apply to the individual. So moving on, a common dosing strategy that we see is to begin at 20 milligrams twice a day or 30 milligrams once a day, and then increase after one week by 20 to 30 milligrams up to 60 milligrams. However, when you're in the outpatient world, it's important to remember that you can start at lower doses and you can titrate much slower. Of course, this is depending on the patient, but in general, this is true. So this will allow the patient to tolerate the medication much better. Now, moving on to pharmacokinetics. Duloxetine is a substrate of, aka it's broken down by, CYP2D6 and CYP1A2. So, one little tidbit to know is that smoking induces CYP1A2, so we would expect it to lower levels of duloxetine. Duloxetine is also an inhibitor of CYP2D6. And another important tidbit to know is that a lot of the antipsychotics are substrates of 2D6. So just be wary if you're combining duloxetine with antipsychotics, as you might increase the level of the antipsychotic. Also, duloxetine is highly protein-bound, but it does not depend on the peak glycoprotein. Now, in regards to monitoring, there are really two things you should consider, and that's LFTs and blood pressure. So we know that duloxetine can impact liver function, especially in patients with pre-existing liver disease or patients who consume a lot of alcohol. So in these patients, it can be helpful to have baseline LFTs and then monitoring it from time to time. And then it's important to know that duloxetine can cause an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. So it's helpful to have a baseline measurement and to check it from time to time, especially in patients with pre-existing hypertension or cardiovascular disease. Now, this monitoring is not mandatory. You can still use these medications if you don't have, for example, a baseline LFT, but you don't really wanna get stuck in a situation where a patient comes back with elevated LFTs or elevated blood pressure and you don't have a baseline. So you don't know what role the duloxetine played. Hello, I am the creator of Psychopharm. 
I'm here today to announce the Psychopharm Antidepressant Psychopharmacology course. I've put what can only be described as a stupid amount of time into making this course. I learned a new software so that the graphics are nice and clean. Um, I've put all my free time into making these videos. I'm covering a lot in this course. It's going to go over kind of the basics of treating depression. It's going to go over the SSRIs, the SNRIs, the MAOIs, the TCAs, and some of the atypical antidepressants. I really appreciate all the support. If you can share this with people who you think would be interested in this course, I would really appreciate it. If this goes okay, then I can justify continuing to spend so much time on making this stuff, and I hope to eventually move to an antipsychotic course, a mood stabilizer course. Um, I have a lot of ideas, I just need to justify using all this time on these projects. Thank you for watching, thank you for considering, um, have a good day.